Section five of Three Soldiers. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by M. B. Three Soldiers by John Dos Passos. Section five. Four. Yvonne tossed the omelette in the air. It landed sizzling in the pan again, and she came forward into the light, holding the frying pan before her. Behind her was the dark stove, and above it a row of copper kettles that gleamed through the bluish obscurity. She flicked the omelet out of the pan into the white dish that stood in the middle of the table, full in the yellow lamplight. Tiens, she said, brushing a few stray hairs off her forehead with the back of her hand. You're some cook, said Fuselli, getting to his feet. He had been sprawling on a chair in the other end of the kitchen watching Yvonne's slender body in tight black dress and blue apron move in and out of the area of light as she got dinner ready. A smell of burnt butter with a faint tang of pepper in it filled the kitchen, making his mouth water. This is the real stuff, he was saying to himself. Like home. He stood with his hands deep in his pockets and his head thrown back, watching her cut the bread holding the big loaf to her chest and pulling the knife towards her. She brushed some crumbs off her dress with a thin white hand. You're my girl, Yvonne, ain't you? Fuseli put his arms around her. Sal bet, she said, laughing and pushing him away. There was a brisk step outside, and another girl came into the kitchen. A thin, yellow-faced girl, with a sharp nose and long teeth. Ma cousine, mon petit américain, they both laughed. Fuseli blushed as he shook the girl's hand. Elle est bon, hein? said Yvonne gruffly. Mais ma petite, il est charmant, votre américain. They laughed again. Fuseli, who did not understand, laughed too, thinking to himself, They'll let the dinner get cold if they don't sit down soon. Get maman then, said Yvonne. Fuseli went into the shop through the room with the long oak table. In the dim light that came from the kitchen he saw the old woman's white bonnet. Her face was in shadow, but there was a faint gleam of light in her small, beady eyes. Supper, ma'am, he shouted, grumbling in her creaky little voice. The old woman followed him back into the kitchen. Steam, gilded by the lamplight, rose in pillars to the ceiling from the big tureen of soup. There was a white cloth on the table and a big loaf of bread at the end. The plates, with borders of little roses on them, seemed, after the army mess, the most beautiful things Fuseli had ever seen. The wine bottle was black beside the soup tureen and the wine in the glasses cast a dark purple stain on the cloth. Fuseli ate his soup silently, understanding very little of the French that the two girls rattled at each other. The old woman rarely spoke, and when she did one of the girls would throw her a hasty remark that hardly interrupted their chatter. Fuseli was thinking of the other men, lining up outside the dark mess shack, and the sound the food made when it flopped into the mess kits. An idea came to him. He'd have to bring Sarge to see Yvonne. They could set him up to a feed. It would help me to stay in good with him. He had a minute's worry about his corporalship. He was acting corporal right enough, but he wanted them to send in his appointment. The omelette melted in his mouth. Damn bon, he said to Yvonne with a mouthful. She looked at him fixedly. Bon, bon, he said again. You, Dan, Bong, she said and laughed. The cousin was looking from one to the other enviously, her upper lip lifted away from her teeth in a smile. The old woman munched her bread in a silent, preoccupied fashion. There's somebody in the store, said Fuseli after a long pause. Je irai. He put his napkin down and went out wiping his mouth on the back of his hand. Eisenstein and a chalky-faced boy were in the shop. "'Hello, you keepin' house here?' 
asked Eisenstein. Sure, said Fuselli conceitedly. Have you got any chocolate? asked the chalky-faced boy in a thin, bloodless voice. Fuselli looked round the shelves and threw a cake of chocolate down on the counter. Anything else? Nothing, thank you, Corporal. How much is it? Whistling, there's a long, long trail a-winding. Fuselli strode back into the inner room. Combien chocolate? he asked. When he had received his money, he sat down at his place at table again, smiling importantly. He must write Al about all this, he was thinking and he was wondering vaguely whether Al had been drafted yet. After dinner, the women sat a long time chatting over their coffee, while Fuselli squirmed uneasily on his chair, looking now and then at his watch. His pass was till twelve only, and was already getting on to ten. He tried to catch Yvonne's eye, but she was moving about the kitchen putting things in order for the night and hardly seemed to notice him. At last the old woman shuffled back into the shop, and there was the sound of a key clicking hard in the outside door. When she came back, Fuselli said good night to everyone and left by the back door into the court. There he leaned sulkily against the wall and waited in the dark, listening to the sounds that came from the house. He could see shadows passing across the orange square of light the window threw on the cobbles of the court. A light went on in an upper window, sending a faint glow over the disorderly tiles of the roof of the shed opposite. The door opened, and Yvonne and her cousin stood on the broad stone doorstep, chattering. Fuselli had pushed himself in behind a big hogshead that had a pleasant tang of old wood damp with sour wine. At last the heads of the shadows on the cobbles came together for a moment and the cousin clattered across the court and out into the empty streets. Her rapid footsteps died away. Yvonne's shadow was still in the door. Dan, she said softly. Fuselli came out from behind the hogshead, his whole body flushing with the light. Yvonne pointed to his shoes. He took them off and left them beside the door. He looked at his watch. It was a quarter to eleven. Viens, she said. He followed her, his knees trembling a little from excitement, up the steep stairs. The deep, broken strokes of the town clock had just begun to strike midnight, when Fuselli hurried in the camp gate. He gave up his pass jauntily to the guard and strolled towards his barracks. The long shed was pitch black, full of a sound of deep breathing and of occasional snoring. There was a thick smell of uniform wool on which the sweat had dried. Fuselli undressed without haste, stretching his arms luxuriously. He wriggled into his blankets feeling cool and tired, and went to sleep with a smile of self-satisfaction on his lips. The companies were lined up for retreat, standing stiff as toy soldiers outside their barracks. The evening was almost warm. A little playful wind, oozing with springtime, played with the swollen buds on the plane trees. The sky was a drowsy violet color, and the blood pumped hot and stinging through the stiffened arms and legs of the soldiers who stood at attention. The voices of the non-coms were particularly harsh and metallic this evening. It was rumored that a general was about. Orders were shouted with fury. Standing behind the line of his company, Fuselli's chest was stuck out until the buttons of his tunic were in danger of snapping off. His shoes were well shined, and he wore a new pair of puttees, wound so tightly that his legs ached. At last the bugle sounded across the silent camp. "'Parade rest!' shouted the lieutenant. Fuselli's mind was full of the army regulations which he had been studying assiduously for the last week. He was thinking of an imaginary examination for the corporalship, which he would pass, of course. When the company was dismissed, he went up familiarly to the top sergeant. "'Say, Sarge!' 
doing anything this evening? What the hell can a man do when he's broke? said the top sergeant. Well, you come downtown with me. I want to introduce you to somebody. Great. Say, Sarge, have they sent that appointment in yet? No, they haven't, Fuselli, said the top sergeant. It's all made out, he added encouragingly. They walked towards the town silently. The evening was silvery violet. The few windows in the old grey-green houses that were lighted shone orange. Well, I'm going to get it, ain't I? A staff car shot by, splashing them with mud, leaving them a glimpse of officers leaning back in the deep cushions. You sure are, said the top sergeant, in his good-natured voice. They had reached the square. They saluted stiffly as two officers brushed past them. What's the regulations about a feller marrying a French girl? broke out Fuselli suddenly. Thinking of getting hitched up, are you? Hell no, Fuselli was crimson. I just sort of wanted to know. Permission of C.O., that's all I know. They had stopped in front of the grocery shop. Fuselli peered in through the window. The shop was full of soldiers lounging against the corner and the walls. In the midst of them, demurely knitting, sat Yvonne. Let's go and have a drink and then come back, said Fuselli. They went to the café where Marie of the White Arms presided. Fuselli paid for two hot rum punches. You see, it's this way, Sarge, he said confidentially. I wrote all my folks at home I'd been made corporal, and it'd be a hell of a note to be let down now. The top sergeant was drinking his hot drink in little sips. He smiled broadly and put his hand paternal fashion on Fuselli's knee. Sure, you needn't worry, kid. I've got you fixed up all right, he said. Then he added jovially, Well, let's go see that girl of yours. They went out into the dark streets, where the wind, despite the smell of burnt gasoline and army camps, had a faint suavity, something like the smell of mushrooms, the smell of spring. Yvonne sat under the lamp in the shop, her feet up on a box of canned peas, yawning dismally. Behind her on the counter was the glass case full of yellow and greenish-white cheeses. Above that shelves rose to the ceiling in the brownish obscurity of the shop, where gleamed faintly large jars and small jars. Cans neatly placed in rows, glass jars and vegetables. In the corner, near the glass-curtained door that led to the inner room, hung clusters of sausages large and small, red, yellow, and speckled. Yvonne jumped up when Fuselli and the sergeant opened the door. "'You are good,' she said. "'Je m'aurai de cafard.' They laughed. "'You know what that means, cafard?' Sure. It is only since the war. Avant la guerre, on ne savait pas ce que c'était le cafard. The war is no good. Funny, ain't it? said Fuselli to the top sergeant. A feller can't just figure out what the war is like. Don't you worry. We'll all get there, said the top sergeant, knowingly. This is the sergeant, Yvonne, said Fuselli. Oui, oui, je sais said Yvonne, smiling at the top sergeant. They sat in the little room behind the shop and drank white wine and talked as best they could to Yvonne, who, very trim in her black dress and blue apron, perched on the edge of her chair with her feet in tiny pumps pressed tightly together and glanced now and then at the elaborate stripes on the top sergeant's arm. Fuselli strode familiarly into the grocery shop, whistling, and threw open the door to the inner room. His whistling stopped in the middle of a bar. "'Hello,' he said, in an annoyed voice. "'Hello, Corporal,' said Eisenstein. 
Eisenstein, his French soldier friend, a lanky man with a scraggly black beard and burning eyes, and Stockton, the chalky-faced boy, were sitting at the table that filled up the room, chatting intimately and gaily with Yvonne who leaned against the yellow wall beside the Frenchman and showed all her little pearly teeth in a laugh. In the middle of the dark oak table was a pot of hyacinths and some glasses that had some wine in them. The odor of the hyacinths hung in the air with a faint warm smell from the kitchen. After a second's hesitation, Fuseli sat down to wait until the others should leave. It was long after payday, and his pockets were empty, so he had nowhere else to go. "'How are they treating you down in your outfit now?' asked Eisenstein of Stockton after a silence. S "'Same as ever,' said Stockton in his thin voice, stuttering a little. "'Sometimes I wish I was dead.' "'Hum,' said Eisenstein, a curious expression of understanding on his flabby face. We'll be civilians some day. I won't, said Stockton. Hell, said Eisenstein, you've got to keep your upper lip stiff. I thought I was going to die in that troop ship coming over here. And when I was little and came over with the emigrants from Poland, I thought I was going to die. A man can stand more than he thinks for... I never thought I could stand being in the army, being a slave-like and all that, and I'm still here. No, you'll live long and be successful yet. He put his hand on Stockton's shoulder. The boy winced and drew his chair away. What for you do that? I ain't gonna hurt you, said Eisenstein. Fuseli looked at them both with a disgusted interest. I'll tell you what you'd better do, kid, he said condescendingly. You get transferred to our company. It's an A-1 bunch, ain't it, Eisenstein? We've got a good loot and a good top kicker and a damn good bunch of fellows. Our top kicker was in here a few minutes ago, said Eisenstein. Was he? said Fuseli. Where'd he go? Damned if I know. Yvonne and the French soldier were talking in low voices, laughing a little now and then. Fuseli leaned back in his chair, looking at them, feeling out of things wishing despondently that he knew enough French to understand what they were saying. He scraped his feet angrily back and forth on the floor. His eyes lit on the white hyacinths. They made him think of the florist's windows at home, at Easter time, and the noise and bustle of San Francisco's streets. God, I hate this rotten hole, he muttered to himself. He thought of Mabe. He made a noise with his lips. Hell, she was married by this time. Anyway, Yvonne was the girl for him. If only he could have Yvonne to himself. Far away somewhere, away from the other man and that damn frog and her old mother. He thought of himself going to the theater with Yvonne. When he was a sergeant, he would be able to afford that sort of thing. He counted up the months. It, it was March. Here he'd been in Europe five months and he was still only a corporal, and not that yet. He clenched his fists with impatience. But once he got to be a non-com, it would go faster, he told himself reassuringly. He leaned over and sniffed loudly at the hyacinths. They smell good, he said. Que disez-vous, Yvonne? Yvonne looked at him as if she had forgotten that he was in the room. Her eyes looked straight into his, and she burst out laughing. Her glance had made him feel warm all over, and he leaned back in his chair again, looking at her slender body so neatly cased in its black dress, and at her little head with its tightly done hair, with a comfortable feeling of possession. "'Yvonne, come here,' he said, beckoning with his head. She looked from him to the Frenchman provocatively. Then she came over and stood behind him. Que voulez-vous? Fuseli glanced at Eisenstein. He and Stockton were deep in excited conversation with the Frenchman again. Fuseli heard that uncomfortable word that always made him angry, he did not know why. Revolution. Yvonne, he said so that only she could hear. What you say you and me get married? 
Marier. Why, toi? asked Yvonne in a puzzled voice. Oui, oui. She looked him in the eyes a moment, and then threw back her head in a paroxysm of hysterical laughter. Fuselli flushed scarlet, got to his feet, and strode out, slamming the door behind him so that the glass rang. He walked hurriedly back to camp, splashed with mud by the long lines of grey motor trucks that were throbbing their way slowly through the main street, each with a yellow eye that lit up faintly the tailboards of the truck ahead. The barracks were dark and nearly empty. He sat down at the sergeant's desk and began moodily turning over the pages of the little blue book of army regulations. The moonlight glittered in the fountain at the end of the main square of the town. It was a warm, dark night of faint clouds through which the moon shone palely as through a thin silk canopy. Fuselli stood by the fountain smoking a cigarette, looking at the yellow windows of the Cheval Blanc at the other end of the square, from which came a sound of voices and of billiard balls clinking. He stood quiet, letting the acrid cigarette smoke drift out through his nose, his ears full of the silvery tinkle of the water in the fountain beside him. There were little drifts of warm and chilly air in the breeze that blew fitfully from the west. Fuseli was waiting. He took out his watch now and then, and strained his eyes to see the time, but there was not light enough. At last the deep, broken note of the bell in the church spire struck once. It must be half-past ten. He started walking slowly towards the street where Yvonne's grocery shop was. The faint glow of the moon lit up the grey houses with the shuttered windows and the tumultuous red roofs full of little dormers and skylights. Fuseli felt deliciously at ease with the world. He could almost feel Yvonne's body in his arms, and he smiled as he remembered the little faces she used to make at him. He slunk past the shuttered windows of the shop and dove into the darkness under the arch that led to the court. He walked cautiously, on tiptoe, keeping close to the moss-covered wall, for he heard voices in the court. He peeped round the edge of the building and saw that there were several people in the kitchen door talking. He drew his head back into the shadow, but he had caught a glimpse of the dark round form of the hogshead beside the kitchen door. If only he could get behind that as he usually did, he would be hidden until the people went away. Keeping well in the shadow round the edge of the court, he slipped to the other side and was just about to pop himself in behind the hogshead when he noticed that someone was there before him. He caught his breath and stood still, his heart thumping. The figure turned, and in the dark he recognized the top sergeant's round face. "'Keep quiet, can't you?' whispered the top sergeant peevishly. Fuseli stood still with his fists clenched. The blood flamed through his head, making his scalp tingle. Still, the top sergeant was the top sergeant, came the thought. It would never do to get in wrong with him. Fuseli's legs moved him automatically back into a corner of the court, where he leaned against the damp wall, glaring with smarting eyes at the two women who stood talking outside the kitchen door, and at the dark shadow behind the hogshead. At last, after several smacking kisses, the women went away and the kitchen door closed. The bell in the church spire struck eleven slowly and mournfully. When it had ceased striking, Fuseli heard a discreet tapping and saw the shadow of the top sergeant against the door. As he slipped in, Fuseli heard the top sergeant's good-natured voice in a large stage whisper, followed by a choked laugh from Yvonne. The door closed, and the light was extinguished leaving the court in darkness except for a faint, marbled glow in the sky. Fuseli strode out, making as much noise as he could with his heels on the cobblestones. The streets of the town were silent under the pale moon. In the square the fountain sounded loud and metallic. He gave up his pass to the guard and strode glumly towards the barracks, 
At the door he met a man with a pack on his back. "'Hello, Fuselli,' said a voice he knew. "'Is my old bunk still there?' "'Damned if I know,' said Fuselli. "'I thought they'd shipped you home.' The corporal who'd been on the Red Sox outfield broke into a fit of coughing. "'Hell no,' he said. "'They kept me at that goddamn hospital till they saw I wasn't going to die right away, "'and then they told me to come back to my outfit. "'So here I am.' "'Did they bust you?' said Fuselli, with sudden eagerness. "'Hell no. Why should they? They ain't gone and got a new corporal, have they?' "'No. Not exactly,' said Fuselli. Five. Meadville stood near the camp gate, watching the motor trucks go by on the main road. Gray, lumbering, and mud-covered, they throbbed by, sloughing in and out of the mud-holes in the worn road, in an endless train stretching as far as he could see into the town and as far as he could see up the road. He stood with his legs far apart and spat into the center of the road. Then he turned to the corporal who had been in the Red Sox outfield and said, "'I'll be goddamned if there ain't something doing.' "'A hell of a lot doing.' said the corporal, shaking his head. Seen that guy Daniels who's been to the front? No. Well, he says hell's broke loose. Hell's broke loose. What's happened? By gory, we may see some active service, said Meadville, grinning. By God, I'd give the best cold on my ranch to see some action. Got a ranch? asked the corporal. The motor trucks kept on grinding past monotonously. Their drivers were so splashed with mud, it was hard to see what uniform they wore. "'What do you think?' asked Meadville. "'Think I keep store?' Fuselli walked past them towards the town. "'Say, Fuselli,' said Meadville, "'Corporal says hell's broke loose out there. We may smell gunpowder yet.' Fuselli stopped and joined them. "'I guess poor old Bill Gray's smelt plenty of gunpowder by this time.' he said. I wish I had gone with him, said Meadville. I'll try that little trick myself now the good weather's come on if we don't get a move on soon. Too damn risky. Listen to the kid, it'll be too damn risky in the trenches. Or do you think you're going to get a cushy job in camp here? Hell no. I want to go to the front. I don't want to stay in this hole. Well? But ain't no good throwing yourself in where it don't do no good. A guy wants to get on in this army if he can. What's the good getting on, said the corporal. Won't get home a bit sooner. Hell, but you're a non-com. Another train of motor trucks went by, drowning their talk. Fuselli was packing medical supplies in a box in a great brownish warehouse full of packing cases, where a little sun filtered in through the dusty air at the corrugated sliding tin doors. As he worked, he listened to Daniels talking to Meadville, who worked beside him. "'And the gas is the goddamnedest stuff I ever heard of,' he was saying. "'I've seen fellows with their arms swelled up to twice the size like blisters from it. Mustard gas, they call it.' "'What did you get to go to the hospital?' said Meadville. "'Only pneumonia,' said Daniels. But I had a buddy who was split right in half by a piece of shell. He was standing as near me as you are, and he was whistling Tipperary under his breath, when all at once there was a big spurt of blood, and there he was with his chest split in half and his head hanging a thread like. Meadville moved his quid of tobacco from one cheek to the other and spat onto the sawdust of the floor. The men within earshot stopped working and looked admiringly at Daniels. "'What do you reckon's going on at the front now?' said Meadville. "'Damned if I know. The goddamn hospital at Orléans was so full up there was guys in stretchers waiting all day on the pavement outside. I know that. Fellers there said hell broke loose for fair. Looks to me like the Fritzies was advancing.' Meadville looked at him incredulously. "'Those skunks?' said Fuselli. "'Why, they can't advance. They're starving to death.' The hell they are, said Daniels. I guess you believe everything you see in the papers. 
Eyes looked at Daniels indignantly. They all went on working in silence. Suddenly the lieutenant, looking strangely flustered, strode into the warehouse, leaving the tin door open behind him. Can anyone tell me where Sergeant Osler is? He was here a few minutes ago, spoke up Fuselli. Well, where is he now? snapped the lieutenant angrily. I, I don't know, sir, mumbled Fuselli, flushing. Go and see if you can find him. Fuselli went off to the other end of the warehouse. Outside the door he stopped and bit off a cigarette in a leisurely fashion. His blood boiled sullenly. How the hell should he know where the top sergeant was? They didn't expect him to be a mind-reader, did they? And all the flood of bitterness that had been collecting in his spirit seethed to the surface. They had not treated him right. He felt full of hopeless anger against this vast treadmill to which he was bound. The endless succession of the days, all alike, all subject to orders, to the interminable monotony of drills and line-ups, passed before his mind. He felt he couldn't go on, yet he knew that he must and would go on, that there was no stopping, that his feet would go on beating in time to the steps of the treadmill. He caught sight of the sergeant coming towards the warehouse, across the new green grass, scarred by the marks of truck wheels. Sarge! he called. Then he went up to him mysteriously. The loot wants to see you at once in warehouse B. He slouched back to his work, arriving just in time to hear the lieutenant say in a severe voice to the sergeant, Sergeant, do you know how to draw up court-martial papers? Yes, sir, said the sergeant a look of surprise on his face. He followed the precise steps of the lieutenant out of the door. Fuselli had a moment of panic terror, during which he went on working methodically, although his hands trembled. He was searching his memory for some infringement of a regulation that might be charged against him. The terror passed as fast as it had come. Of course he had no reason to fear. He laughed softly to himself. What a fool he'd been to get scared like that, and a summary court-martial couldn't do much to you anyway. He went on working as fast and carefully as he could through the long, monotonous afternoon. That night nearly the whole company gathered in a group at the end of the barracks. Both sergeants were away. The corporal said he knew nothing and got sulkily into bed where he lay, rolled in his blankets, shaken by fit after fit of coughing. At last someone said, I bet that kike Eisenstein's turned out to be a spy. I bet he has too. He's foreign-born, ain't he? Born in Poland or some goddamn place. He always did talk queer. I always thought, said Fuselli, he'd get into trouble talking the way he did. How'd he talk? asked Daniels. Oh, he said that war was wrong and all that goddamn pro-German stuff. Do you know what they did out at the front? said Daniels. In the second division they made two fellows dig out their own graves and then shot him for saying the war was wrong. Hell, they did. You're goddamn right they did. I tell you, fellows, it don't do to monkey with the buzz saw in this army. For God's sake, shut up! Taps is blown. Meadville, turn the lights out, said the corporal angrily. The barracks was dark full of a sound of men undressing in their bunks, and of whispered talk. The company was lined up for morning mess. The sun that had just risen was shining in rosily through the soft clouds of the sky. The sparrows kept up a great clattering in the avenue of plane trees. Their riotous chirping could be heard above the sound of motors starting that came from a shed opposite the mess shack. The sergeant appeared suddenly, walking past with his shoulders stiff, so that everyone knew at once that something important was going on. "'Attention, men, a minute,' he said. Mess kits clattered as the men turned round. "'After mess I want you to go immediately to barracks and roll your packs. After that every man must stand by his pack until orders come.' The company cheered, and mess kits clattered together like cymbals. "'As you were!' shouted the top sergeant jovially. 
gluey oatmeal and greasy bacon were hurriedly bolted down, and every man in the company, his heart pounding, ran to the barracks to do up his pack, feeling proud under the envious eyes of the company at the other end of the shack that had received no orders. When the packs were done up, they sat on the empty bunks and drummed their feet against the wooden partitions, waiting. "'I don't suppose we'll leave here till hell freezes over,' said Meadville who was doing up the last strap on his pack. It's always like this. You break your neck to obey orders and— Outside! shouted the sergeant, poking his head in the door. Fall in! Attention! The lieutenant, in his trench coat and in a new pair of roll puttees, stood facing the company, looking solemn. Men, he said, biting off his words as a man bites through a piece of hard stick candy. One of your number is up for court-martial for possibly disloyal statements found in a letter addressed to friends at home. I have been extremely grieved to find anything of this sort in any company of mine. I don't believe there is another man in the company, low enough to hold, entertain such ideas. Every man in the company stuck out his chest, vowing inwardly to entertain no ideas at all rather than run the risk of calling forth such disapproval from the lieutenant. The lieutenant paused. All I can say is if there's any such man in the company, he had better keep his mouth shut and be pretty damn careful what he writes home. Dismissed. He shouted the order grimly, as if it were the order for the execution of the offender. That goddamn skunk Eisenstein, said someone. The lieutenant heard it as he walked away. Oh, sergeant, he said familiarly, I think the others have got the right stuff in them. The company went into the barracks and waited. The sergeant major's office was full of a clicking of typewriters and was overheated by a black stove that stood in the middle of the floor, letting out occasional little puffs of smoke from a crack in the stovepipe. The sergeant major was a small man with a fresh boyish face and a drawling voice who lolled behind a large typewriter reading a magazine that lay on his lap. Fuseli stepped in behind the typewriter and stood with his cap in his hand beside the sergeant major's chair. "'Well, what do you want?' asked the sergeant major gruffly. "'A fellow told me, sergeant major, that he was looking for a man with optical experience.' Fuseli's voice was velvety. "'Well, I worked three years in an optical goods store at home in Frisco.' What's your name, rank, company? Daniel Fuseli, Private First Class Company C, Medical Supply Warehouse. All right, I'll attend to it. But, Sergeant... All right, out with what you've got to say, quick. The Sergeant Major fingered the leaves of his magazine impatiently. My company's all packed up to go. The transfer'll have to be today, Sergeant. Why the hell didn't you come in earlier? Stevens... Make out a transfer to headquarters company and get the major to sign it when he goes through. That's the way it always is, he cried, leaning back tragically in his swivel chair. Everybody always puts everything off on me at the last minute. Thank you, sir, said Fuseli, smiling. The sergeant major ran his hand through his hair and took up his magazine again peevishly. Fuseli hurried back to barracks where he found the company still waiting. Several men were crouched in a circle playing craps. The rest lounged in their bare bunks or fiddled with their packs. Outside it had begun to rain softly, and a smell of wet, sprouting earth came in through the open door. Fuseli sat on the floor beside his bunk, throwing his knife down so that it stuck in the boards between his knees. He was whistling softly to himself. The day dragged on. Several times he heard the town clock strike in the distance. At last the top sergeant came in, shaking the water off his slicker, a serious, important expression on his face. Inspection of medical belts, he shouted. Everyone open up their belt and lay it on the floor at the foot of their bunk and stand at attention on the left side. The lieutenant and a major appeared suddenly at one end of the barracks and came through slowly pulling the little packets out of the belts. The men looked at them out of the corners of their eyes. As they examined the belts, 
they chatted easily, as if they had been alone. Yes, said the Major, we're in for it this time. That damned offensive. Well, we'll be able to show them what we're good for, said the lieutenant, laughing. We haven't had a chance yet. Hum! Better mark that belt, lieutenant, and have it changed. Been out to the front yet? No, sir. Hm, well, you'll look at things differently when you have, said the major. The lieutenant frowned. Well, on the whole, lieutenant, your outfit is in very good shape. At ease, men. The lieutenant and the major stood at the door a moment, raising the collars of their coats. Then they drove out into the rain. A few minutes later, the sergeant came in. All right, get your slickers on and line up. They stood lined up in the rain for a long while. It was a leaden afternoon. The even clouds had a faint coppery tinge. The rain beat on their faces, making them tingle. Fuselli was looking anxiously at the sergeant. At last the lieutenant appeared. Attention, cried the sergeant. The roll was called, and a new man fell in at the end of the line, a tall man with large, protruding eyes like a calf's. Private First Class Daniel Fuselli, fall out and report to headquarters company. Fuselli saw a look of surprise come over men's faces. He smiled wanly at Meadville. Sergeant, take the men down to the station. Squads right, cried the sergeant. March. The company tramped off into the streaming rain. Fuselli went back to the barracks, took off his pack and slicker, and wiped the water off his face. The rails gleamed gold in the early morning sunshine above the deep purple cinders of the track. Fuselli's eyes followed the track until it curved into a cutting where the wet clay was a bright orange in the clear light. The station platform, where puddles from the night's rain glittered as the wind ruffled them, was empty. Fuselli started walking up and down with his hands in his pockets. He had been sent down to unload some supplies that were coming on that morning's train. He felt free and successful since he joined the headquarters company. At last, he told himself, he had a job where he could show what he was good for. He walked up and down, whistling shrilly. A train pulled slowly into the station. The engine stopped to take water, and the couplings clanked all down the line of cars. The platform was suddenly full of men in khaki, stamping their feet, running up and down, shouting. "'Where are you guys going?' asked Fuselli. "'We're bound for Palm Beach. Don't we look it?' someone snarled in reply. But Fuselli had seen a familiar face. He was shaking hands with two browned men whose faces were grimy with days of traveling in freight cars. "'Hello, Chrisfield! Hello, Andrews!' he cried. "'When did you fellows get over here?' Oh, "'About four months ago,' said Chrisfield, whose black eyes looked at Fuselli searchingly. "'Oh, I remember you. You're Fuselli. We was at training camp together. Remember him, Andy?' "'Sure,' said Andrews. "'How you making out?' Fine, said Fuselli. I'm in the optical department here. Where the hell's that? Right here. Fuselli pointed vaguely behind the station. We've been training for about four months near Bordeaux, said Andrews, and now we're going to see what it's like. The whistle blew and the engine started puffing hard. Clouds of white steam filled the station platform, where the soldiers scampered for their cars. Good luck! said Fuselli, but Andrews and Chrisfield had already gone. He saw them again as the train pulled out, two brown and dirt-grimed faces among many other brown and dirt-grimed faces. The steam floated up, tinged with yellow, in the bright early morning air as the last car of the train disappeared round the curve into the cutting. The dust rose thickly about the worn broom. As it was a dark morning, very little light filtered into the room full of great white packing cases, where Fuselli was sweeping. He stopped now and then, and leaned on his broom. Far away, 
you heard a sound of trains shunting and shouts and the sound of feet tramping in unison from the drill ground. The building where he was was silent. He went on sweeping, thinking of his company tramping off through the streaming rain and of those fellows he had known in training camp in America, Andrews and Crisfield, jolting in box cars towards the front, where Daniel's buddy had had his chest split in half by a piece of shell. And he'd written home he'd been made a corporal. What was he going to do when letters came for him addressed Corporal Dan Fuselli? Putting the broom away, he dusted the yellow chair and the table covered with order slips that stood in the middle of the piles of packing boxes. The door slammed somewhere below, and there was a step on the stairs that led to the upper part of the warehouse. A little man with a monkey-like grayish-brown face and spectacles appeared and slipped out of his overcoat like a very small bean popping out of a very large pod. The sergeant's stripes looked unusually wide and conspicuous on his thin arm. He grunted at Fuselli, sat down at his desk, and began at once peering among the order slips. "'Anything in our mailbox this morning?' he asked Fuselli in a hoarse voice. "'It's all there, sergeant,' said Fuselli. The sergeant peered about the desk some more. "'You have to wash that window today,' he said after a pause. "'Major's likely to come round here any time. Ought to have done yesterday.' "'All right,' said Fuselli, dully. He slouched over to the corner of the room, got the worn broom, and began sweeping down the stairs. The dust rose about him, making him cough. He stopped and leaned on the broom. He thought of all the days that had gone by since he'd last seen those fellows, Andrews and Crisfield, at training camp in America, and of all the days that would go by. He started sweeping again, sweeping the dust down from stair to stair. Fuselli sat on the end of his bunk. He had just shaved. It was a Sunday morning, and he looked forward to having the afternoon off. He rubbed his face on his towel and got to his feet. Outside, the rain fell in great silvery sheets, so that the noise on the tar-paper roof of the barracks was almost deafening. Fuselli noticed, at the other end of the row of bunks, a group of men who all seemed to be looking at the same thing. Rolling down his sleeves with his tunic hitched over one arm, he walked down to see what was the matter. Through the patter of the rain, he heard a thin voice say, it ain't no use, sergeant. I'm sick. I ain't a-goin' to get up. The kid's crazy, someone beside Fuselli said, turning away. You get up this minute, roared the sergeant. He was a big man with black hair who looked like a lumberman. He stood over the bunk. In the bunk, at the end of a bundle of blankets, was the chalk-white face of Stockton. The boy's teeth were clenched and his eyes were round and protruding, it seemed, from terror. "'You get out of bed this minute!' roared the sergeant again. The boy was silent. His white cheeks quivered. "'What the hell's the matter with him?' "'Why don't you yank about yourself, Sarge?' "'You get out of bed this minute!' shouted the sergeant again, paying no attention. The men gathered about walked away. Fuselli watched, fascinated, from a little distance. "'All right, then. I'll get the lieutenant. This is a court-martial offense. Here, Morton and Morrison, you're guards over this man.' The boy lay still in his blankets. He closed his eyes. By the way the blanket rose and fell over his chest, they could see that he was breathing heavily. "'Say, Stockton, why don't you get up, you fool?' said Fuselli. "'You can't buck the whole army.' The boy didn't answer. Fuselli walked away. "'He's crazy,' he muttered. The lieutenant was a stoutish, red-faced man who came in puffing, followed by the tall sergeant. He stopped and shook the water off his campaign hat. The rain kept up its deafening patter on the roof. "'Look here, are you sick?' "'If you are, report sick call at once,' said the lieutenant in an elaborately kind voice. 
The boy looked at him dully and did not answer. You should get up and stand at attention when an officer speaks to you. I ain't going to get up, came the thin voice. The officer's red face became crimson. Sergeant, what's the matter with the man? he asked in a furious tone. I can't do anything with him, Lieutenant. I think he's gone crazy. Rubbish! Mere insubordination! You're under arrest, do you hear? he shouted towards the bed. There was no answer. The rain pattered hard on the roof. Have him brought down to the guardhouse by force if necessary, snapped the lieutenant. He strode towards the door. And, Sergeant, start drawing up court-martial papers at once. The door slammed behind him. Now you've got to get him up, said the sergeant to the two guards. Fuselli walked away. Ain't some people damn fools, he said to a man at the other end of the barracks. He stood looking out of the window at the bright sheets of rain. Well, get him up! shouted the sergeant. The boy lay with his eyes closed, his chalk-white face half hidden by the blankets. He was very still. "'Well, will you get up and go to the guardhouse, or have we to carry you there?' shouted the sergeant. The guards laid hold of him gingerly and pulled him up to a sitting posture. "'All right, yank him out of bed.' The frail form in khaki shirt and whitish drawers was held up for a moment between the two men. Then it fell, a limp heap, on the floor. Say, Sarge, he's fainted. The hell he has. Say, Morris, and ask one of the orderlies to come up from the infirmary. He ain't fainted. The kid's dead, said the other man. Give me a hand. The sergeant helped lift the body on the bed again. Well, I'll be goddamned, said the sergeant. The eyes had opened. They covered the head with a blanket. End of section five. Of Three Soldiers. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by M. B. Three Soldiers by John Dos Passos. Section 6. Part 3. Machines. 1. The fields and the misty blue-green woods slipped by slowly as the boxcar rumbled and jolted over the rails now stopping for hours on sidings amid meadows, where it was quiet and where above the babble of voices of the regiment you could hear the skylarks, now clattering fast over bridges and along the banks of jade-green rivers where the slim poplars were just coming into leaf, and where now and then a fish jumped. The men crowded in the door, grimy and tired, leaning on each other's shoulders, and watching the ploughed lands slip by, and the meadows where the golden-green grass was dappled with buttercups, and the villages of huddled red roofs lost among pale budding trees and masses of peach blossom. Through the smells of steam and coal smoke and of unwashed bodies in uniforms came smells of moist fields and of manure from fresh-sowed patches, and of cows and pasture-lands just coming into flower. Must be right smart of craps in this country. Ain't like that damn pullin' yak, Andy, said Crisfield. Well, they made us drill so hard there wasn't any time for the grass to grow. You're damn right there warn't. I'd like to live in this country a while, said Crisfield. We might ask him to let us off right here. Can't be that the front's like this, said Judkins, poking his head out between Andrews's and Crisfield's heads so that the bristles of his unshaven chin rubbed against Crisfield's cheek. It was a large, square head with closely cropped light hair and porcelain blue eyes under lids that showed white in the red, sunburned face, and a square jaw made a little gray by the sprouting beard. 
Say, Andy, how the hell long have we all been on this goddamn train? I've done lost track of the time. What's the matter? Are you getting old, Chris? asked Judkins, laughing. Chrisfield had slipped out of the place he held and began poking himself in between Andrews and Judkins. We've been on this train four days and five nights, and we've got half a day's rations left, so we must be getting somewhere, said Andrews. It can't be like this at the front. It must be spring there as well as here, said Andrews. It was a day of fluffy, mauve-tinted clouds that moved across the sky, sometimes darkening to deep blue where a small rainstorm trailed across the hills, sometimes brightening to moments of clear sunlight that gave blue shadows to the poplars and shone yellow on the smoke of the engine that puffed on painfully at the head of the long train. Funny, ain't it? How little everything is. Out Indiana way, we wouldn't look at a cornfield that size. But it sort of reminds me the way it used to be out home in the spring of the year. I'd like to see Indiana in the springtime, said Andrews. Well, you'll come out when the war's over and us guys is all home, won't you, Andy? You bet I will. They were going into the suburbs of a town. Rows and clusters of little brick and stucco houses were appearing along the roads. It began to rain from a sky full of lights of amber and lilac color. The slate roofs and the pinkish-gray streets of the town shone cheerfully in the rain. The little patches of garden were all vivid emerald green. They were looking at rows and rows of red chimney-pots over wet slate roofs that reflected the bright sky. In the distance rose the purple-gray spire of a church and the irregular forms of old buildings. They passed through a station. Dijon, read Andrews. On the platform were French soldiers in their blue coats and a good sprinkling of civilians. Gee, these are about the first real civvies I've seen since I came overseas, said Judkins. Those goddamn country people down at Polignac didn't look like real civilians. There's folks dressed like it was New York. They had left the station and were rumbling slowly past interminable freight trains. At last the train came to a dead stop. A whistle sounded. Don't nobody get out, shouted the sergeant from the car ahead. Hail, they keep you in this goddamn car like you was a convict, muttered Chrisfield. I'd like to get out and walk around Dijon. Oh, boy. I swear I'd make a bee-line for a dairy lunch, said Judkins. Hell of a fine dairy lunch you'll find among these goddamn frogs. No, Vin Blank is all you'd get in that goddamn town. I'm going to sleep, said Chrisfield. He stretched himself out on the pile of equipment at the end of the car. Andrews sat down near him and stared at his mud-caked boots, running one of his long hands as brown as Chrisfield's now, through his light, short-cut hair. Chrisfield lay looking at the gaunt outline of Andrews's face against the light through half-closed eyes, and he felt a warm sort of smile inside him as he said to himself, He's a damn good kid. Then he thought of the spring in the hills of southern Indiana, and the mockingbirds singing in the moonlight among the flowering locust trees behind the house. He could almost smell the heavy sweetness of the locust blooms, as he used to smell them sitting on the steps after supper, tired from a day's heavy plowing, while the clatter of his mother's housework came from the kitchen. He didn't wish he was back there, but it was pleasant to think of it now and then, and how the yellow farmhouse looked and the red barn where his father never had been able to find time to paint the door, and the tumble-down cow-shed where the shingles were always coming off. He wondered dully what it would be like out there at the front. It couldn't be green and pleasant, the way the country was here. Fellas always said it was hell out there. Well, he didn't give a damn. He went to sleep. He woke up gradually, the warm comfort of sleep giving place slowly to the stiffness of his uncomfortable position with the hobnails of a boot from the back of a pack sticking into his shoulder. 
Andrews was sitting in the same position, lost in thought. The rest of the men sat at the open doors or sprawled over the equipment. Chrisfield got up, stretched himself, yawned, and went to the door to look out. There was a heavy, important step on the gravel outside. A large man with black eyebrows that met over his nose and a very black stubbly beard passed the car. There were a sergeant's stripes on his arm. "'Say, Andy!' cried Chrisfield. "'That bastard is a sergeant!' "'Who's that?' asked Andrews, getting up with a smile, his blue eyes looking mildly into Chrisfield's black ones. "'You know who I mean.' Under their heavy tan, Chrisfield's rounded cheeks were flushed. His eyes snapped under their long black lashes. His fists were clutched. "'Oh, I know, Chris. I didn't know he was in this regiment.' "'God damn him!' muttered Chrisfield in a low voice, throwing himself down on his packs again. "'Hold your horses, Chris,' said Andrews. "'We may all cash in our checks before long. "'No use letting things worry us.' "'I don't give a damn if we do.' "'Nor do I, now.' Andrews sat down beside Chrisfield again. After a while the train got jerkily into motion. The wheels rumbled and clattered over the rails, and the clots of mud bounced up and down on the splintered boards of the floor. Chrisfield pillowed his head on his arm and went to sleep again, still smarting from the flush of his anger. Andrews looked out through his fingers at the swaying black box-car, at the men sprawled about on the floor, their heads nodding with each jolt, and at the mauve-gray clouds and the bits of sparkling blue sky that he could see behind the silhouettes of the heads and shoulders of the men who stood in the doors. The wheels ground on, endlessly. The car stopped with a jerk that woke up all the sleepers and threw one man off his feet. A whistle blew shrilly outside. "'All right, out of the cars! Snap it up! Snap it up!' yelled the sergeant. The men piled out stiffly, handing the equipment out from hand to hand till it formed a confused heap of packs and rifles outside. All down the train at each door there was a confused pile of equipment and struggling men. "'Snap it up! Full equipment! Line up!' the sergeant yelled. The men fell into line slowly with their packs and rifles. Lieutenants hovered about the edges of the forming lines, tightly belted into their stiff trench coats, scrambling up and down the coal piles of the siding. The men were given at ease and stood leaning on their rifles, staring at a green water tank on three wooden legs, over the top of which had been thrown a huge piece of torn grey cheesecloth. When the confused sound of tramping feet subsided, they could hear a noise in the distance, like someone lazily shaking a piece of heavy sheet iron. The sky was full of little dabs of red, purple, and yellow, and the purplish sunset light was over everything. The order came to march. They marched down a rutted road where the puddles were so deep they had continually to break ranks to avoid them. In a little pine wood on one side were rows of heavy motor trucks and ammunition caissons. Supper was cooking in a field kitchen about which clustered the truck drivers in their wide-visored caps. Beyond the wood, the column turned off into a field behind a little group of stone and stucco houses that had lost their roofs. In the field, they halted. The grass was brilliant emerald, and the wood and the distant hills were shades of clear, deep blue. Wisps of pale blue mist lay across the field. In the turf here and there were small, clean bites that might have been made by some strange animal. The men looked at them curiously. "'No lights! Remember we're in sight of the enemy! A match might annihilate the detachment!' announced the lieutenant dramatically, after having given the orders for the pup tents to be set up. When the tents were ready, the men stood about in the chilly white mist that kept growing denser eating their cold rations. Everywhere were grumbling, snorting voices. "'God, let's turn in, Chris, before our bones are frozen,' said Andrews. 
Guards had been posted and walked up and down with a business-like stride, peering now and then suspiciously into the little wood where the truck drivers were. Chrisfield and Andrews crawled into their little tent and rolled up together in their blankets, getting as close to each other as they could. At first it was very cold and hard and they squirmed about restlessly, but gradually the warmth from their bodies filled their thin blankets and their muscles began to relax. Andrews went to sleep first, and Chrisfield lay listening to his deep breathing. There was a frown on his face. He was thinking of the man who had walked past the train at Dijon. The last time he had seen that man, Anderson was at training camp. He had only been a corporal then. He remembered the day the man had been made corporal. It had not been long before that that Chrisfield had drawn his knife on him one night in the barracks. A fellow had caught his hand just in time. Anderson had looked a bit pale that time and had walked away, but he'd never spoken a word to Chrisfield since. As he lay with his eyes closed, pressed close against Andrews's limp, sleeping body, Chrisfield could see the man's face, the eyebrows that joined across the nose and the jaw, always blackish from the heavy beard that looked blue when he had just shaved. At last the tenseness of his mind slackened. He thought of women for a moment, of a fair-haired girl he'd seen from the tram, and then suddenly crushing sleepiness closed down on him, and everything went softly, warmly black as he drifted off to sleep, with no sense but the coldness of one side and the warmth of his bunkie's body on the other. In the middle of the night he awoke and crawled out of the tent, Andrews followed him. Their teeth chattered a little, and they stretched their legs stiffly. It was cold, but the mist had vanished. The stars shone brilliantly. They walked out a little way into the field away from the bunch of tents to make water. A faint rustling and breathing noise, as of animals herded together, came from the sleeping regiment. Somewhere a brook made a shrill gurgling. They strained their ears, but they could hear no guns. They stood side by side, looking up at the multitudes of stars. That's Orion, said Andrews. What? That bunch of stars there is called Orion. Do you see him? It's supposed to look like a man with a bow, but he always looks to me like a fellow striding across the sky. Some stars tonight, ain't there? Gee, what's that? Behind the dark hills a glow rose and fell like the glow in a forge. The front must be that way, said Andrews, shivering. I guess we'll know tomorrow. Yes, tomorrow night we'll know more about it, said Andrews. They stood silent a moment, listening to the noise the brook made. God, it's quiet, ain't it? That can't be the front. Smell that? What is it? it? Smells like an apple tree in bloom somewhere. Hell, let's get in before our blankets get cold. Andrews was still staring at the group of stars he had said was Orion. Chrisfield pulled him by the arm. They crawled into their tent again, rolled up together, and immediately were crushed under an exhausted sleep. As far ahead of him as Chrisfield could see were packs and heads with caps at a variety of angles, all bobbing up and down with the swing of the brisk marching time. A fine, warm rain was falling, mingling with the sweat that ran down his face. The column had been marching a long time, along a straight road that was worn and scarred with heavy traffic. Fields and hedges where clusters of yellow flowers were in bloom, had given place to an avenue of poplars. The light, wet trunks and the stiff branches hazy with green filed by, interminable, as interminable as the confused tramp of feet and jingle of equipment that sounded in his ears. Say, are we going towards the front? God damned if I know. Ain't no front within miles. Men's sentences came shortly through their heavy breathing. 
The column shifted over to the side of the road to avoid a train of motor trucks going the other way. Chrisfield felt the heavy mud spurt up over him as truck after truck rumbled by. With the wet back of one hand he tried to wipe it off his face, but the grit, when he rubbed it, hurt his skin made tender by the rain. He swore long and whiningly half aloud. His rifle felt as heavy as an iron girder. They entered a village of plaster and timber houses. Through open doors they could see into comfortable kitchens where copper pots gleamed and where the floors were of clean red tiles. In front of some of the houses were little gardens full of crocuses and hyacinths, where box bushes shone a very dark green in the rain. They marched through the square with its pavement of little yellow rounded cobbles, its grey church with a pointed arch in the door, its cafes with names painted over them. Men and women looked out of doors and windows. The column perceptibly slackened its speed but kept on, and as the houses dwindled and became farther apart along the road, the men's hope of stopping vanished. Ears were deafened by the confused tramp of feet on the macadam road. Men's feet seemed as lead, as if all the weight of the pack hung on them. Shoulders, worn callous, began to grow tender and sore under the constant sweating. Heads drooped. Each man's eyes were on the heels of the man ahead of him that rose and fell, rose and fell endlessly. Marching became for each man a personal struggle with his pack that seemed to have come alive, that seemed something malicious and overpowering, wrestling to throw him. The rain stopped and the sky brightened a little, taking on pale yellowish lights, as if the clouds that hid the sun were growing thin. The column halted at the edge of a group of farms and barns that scattered along the road. The men sprawled in all directions along the roadside, hiding the bright green grass with the mud color of their uniforms. Chrisfield lay in the field beside the road, pressing his hot face into the wet, sprouting clover. The blood throbbed through his ears. His arms and legs seemed to cleave to the ground, as if he would never be able to move them again. He closed his eyes. Gradually a cold chill began stealing through his body. He sat up and slipped his arms out of the harness of his pack. Someone was handing him a cigarette, and he sniffed a little acrid, sweet smoke. Andrews was lying beside him, his head propped against his pack, smoking, and poking a cigarette towards his friend with a muddy hand. His blue eyes looked strangely from out the flaming red of his mud-splotched face. Chrisfield took the cigarette and fumbled in his pocket for a match. <laughs> that nearly did it for me, said Andrews. Chrisfield grunted. He pulled greedily on the cigarette. A whistle blew. Slowly the men dragged themselves off the ground and fell into line, drooping under the weight of their equipment. The companies marched off separately. Chrisfield overheard the lieutenant saying to a sergeant, Damn fool business, that. Why the hell couldn't they have sent us here in the first place? So we ain't going to the front after all, said the sergeant. Front, hell, said the lieutenant. The lieutenant was a small man who looked like a jockey with a coarse red face, which, now that he was angry, was almost purple. I guess they're going to quarter us here, said somebody. Immediately everybody began saying, we're going to be quartered here. They stood waiting in formation a long while, the packs cutting into their backs and shoulders. At last the sergeant shouted out, All right, take your stuff upstairs. Stumbling on each other's heels, they climbed up into a dark loft, where the air was heavy with the smell of hay and with an acridity of cow manure from the stables below. There was a little straw in the corners, on which those who got there first spread their blankets. Chrisfield and Andrews tucked themselves in a corner from which through a hole where the tiles had fallen off the roof they could see down into the barnyard 
where white and speckled chickens pecked about with jerky movements. A middle-aged woman stood in the doorway of the house looking suspiciously at the files of khaki-clad soldiers that shuffled slowly into the barns by every door. An officer went up to her, a little red book in his hand. A conversation about some matter proceeded painfully. The officer grew very red. Andrews threw back his head and laughed, luxuriously rolling from side to side in the straw. Chrisfield laughed, too. He hardly knew why. Over their heads they could hear the feet of pigeons on the roof, and a constant drowsy roo-coo-coo-coo. Through the barnyard smells began to drift, the greasiness of food cooking in the field kitchen. "'I hope they give us something good to eat,' said Chrisfield. "'I'm hungry as a thrasher.' "'So am I,' said Andrews. "'Say, Andy, you can talk their language a little, can't you?' Andrews nodded his head vaguely. "'Well, maybe we can get some eggs or something out of the lady there. Will you try after mess?' "'All right.' They both lay back in the straw and closed their eyes. Their cheeks still burned from the rain. Everything seemed very peaceful. The men sprawled about talking in low, drowsy voices. Outside another shower had come up and beat softly on the tiles of the roof. Chrisfield thought he had never been so comfortable in his life, although his soaked shoes pinched his cold feet and his knees were wet and cold. But in the drowsiness of the rain, and of voices talking quietly about him, he fell asleep. He dreamed he was at home in Indiana, but instead of his mother cooking at the stove in the kitchen, there was the French woman who had stood in the farmhouse door, and near her stood a lieutenant with a little red book in his hand. He was eating cornbread and syrup off a broken plate. It was fine cornbread with a great deal of crust on it, crisp and hot, on which the butter was cold and sweet to his tongue. Suddenly he stopped eating and started swearing, shouting at the top of his lungs, "'You goddamn!' he started, but he couldn't seem to think of anything more to say. "'You goddamn!' he started again. The lieutenant looked towards him, wrinkling his black eyebrows that met across his nose. He was Sergeant Anderson. Chris drew his knife and ran at him, but it was Andy, his bunkie, he had run his knife into. He threw his arms round Andy's body, crying hot tears. He woke up. Mess kits were clinking all about the dark, crowded loft. The men had already started piling down the stairs. The larks filled the wine-tinged air with a constant chiming of little bells. Chrisfield and Andrews were strolling across a field of white clover that covered the brow of a hill. Below in the valley they could see a cluster of red roofs of farms and the white ribbon of the road where long trains of motor trucks crawled like beetles. The sun had just set below the blue hills on the other side of the shallow valley. The air was full of the smell of clover and of hawthorn from the hedgerows. They took deep breaths as they crossed the field. "'It's great to get away from that crowd,' Andrews was saying. Chrisfield walked on silently, dragging his feet through the matted clover. A leaden dullness weighed like some sort of warm, choking coverlet on his limbs, so that it seemed an effort to walk, an effort to speak. Yet under it his muscles were taut and trembling, as he had known them to be before when he was about to get into a fight or make love to a girl. "'Why the hell didn't they let us get into it?' he said suddenly. "'Yes, anything would be better than this. Wait, wait, wait.' They walked on, hearing the constant chirrup of the larks, the brush of their feet through the clover, the faint jingle of some coins in Chrisfield's pocket and in the distance the irregular snoring of an aeroplane motor. As they walked, Andrews leaned over from time to time and picked a couple of the white clover flowers. The aeroplane came suddenly nearer and swooped in a wide curve above the field, drowning every sound with the roar of its exhaust. They made out the figures of the pilot and the observer before the plane rose again 
and vanished against the ragged purple clouds of the sky. The observer had waved a hand at them as he passed. They stood still in the darkening field, staring up at the sky, where a few larks still hung chirping. "'I'd like to be one of them guys,' said Chrisfield. "'You would?' God damn it, I'd do anything to get out of this hellish infantry. This ain't no sort of a life for a man to be treated like he was a nigger. No, it's no sort of life for a man. If they'd let us get to the front and do some fighting and be done with it, but all we do is drill and have grenade practice and drill again and then have bayonet practice and drill again. Enough to drive a feller crazy. What the hell's the use of talking about it, Chris? We can't be any lower than we are, can we? Andrews laughed. There's that plane again. Where? There, just going down behind the piece of woods. That's where their field is. I bet them guys has a good time. I put in an application back in training camp for aviation. Ain't never heard nothing from it, though. If I had, I wouldn't be lower than dirt in this hog pen. It's wonderful up here on the hill this evening, said Andrews, looking dreamily at the pale orange band of light where the sun had set. Let's go down and get a bottle of wine. Now you're talking. I wonder if that girl's down there tonight. Antoinette? Um, uh-huh. hmm. Boy, I'd like to have her by myself some night. Their steps grew brisker as they strode along a grass-grown road that led through high hedgerows to a village under the brow of the hill. It was almost dark under the shadow of the bushes on either side. Overhead, the purple clouds were washed over by a pale yellow light that gradually faded to gray. Birds chirped and rustled among the young leaves. Andrews put his hand on Chrisfield's shoulder. Let's walk slow, he said. We don't want to get out of here too soon. He grabbed carelessly at a little cluster of hawthorn flowers as he passed them, and seemed reluctant to untangle the thorny branches that caught in his coat and on his loosely wound puttees. Hell, man, said Chrisfield, we won't have time to get a bellyful. It must be getting late already. They hastened their steps again and came in a moment to the first tightly shuttered houses of the village. In the middle of the road was an M.P., who stood with his legs wide apart, waving his billy languidly. He had a red face. His eyes were fixed on the shuttered upper window of a house, through the chinks of which came a few streaks of yellow light. His lips were puckered as if to whistle, but no sound came. He swayed back and forth indecisively. An officer came suddenly out of the little green door of the house in front of the M.P., who brought his heels together with a jump and saluted, holding his hand a long while to his cap. The officer flicked a hand up hastily to his hat, snatching his cigar out of his mouth for an instant. As the officer's steps grew fainter down the road, the M.P. gradually returned to his former position. Chrisfield and Andrews had slipped by on the other side, and gone in at the door of a small ramshackle house, of which the windows were closed by heavy wooden shutters. "'I bet there ain't many of them bastards at the front,' said Chris. "'Not many of either kind of bastards,' said Andrews, laughing, as he closed the door behind them. They were in a room that had once been the parlour of a farmhouse. The chandelier with its bits of crystal— and the orange blossoms on a dusty piece of red velvet under a bell-glass on the mantelpiece denoted that. The furniture had been taken out, and four square oak tables crowded in. At one of the tables sat three Americans, and at another a very young, olive-skinned French soldier, who sat hunched over his table, looking moodily down into his glass of wine. A girl in a faded frock of some purplish material that showed the strong curves of her shoulders and breasts slouched into the room, her hands in the pocket of a dark blue apron against which her rounded forearms showed golden brown. Her face had the same golden tan under a mass of dark blonde hair. She smiled when she saw the two soldiers. 
drawing her thin lips away from her ugly yellow teeth. "'Ça va bien, Antoinette?' asked Andrews. "'Oui,' she said, looking beyond their heads at the French soldier who sat at the other side of the little room. "'A bottle of Van Rouge, vite,' said Chrisfield. "'You needn't be so damn vite about it tonight, Chris,' said one of the men at the other table. "'Why?' "'Ain't it going to be no roll call. Corporal told me hisself. Sarge has gone out to get stewed and the loot's away. Sure, said another man, we can stay out as late as we goddamn please tonight. There's a new MP in town, said Chrisfield. I saw him myself. Didn't you too? Didn't you too, Andy? Andrews nodded. He was looking at the Frenchman, who sat with his face in shadow and his black lashes covering his eyes. A purplish flush had suffused the olive skin at his cheekbones. "'Oh, boy,' said Crisfield, "'that old wine sure do go down fast. "'Say, Antoinette, got any cognac?' "'I'm going to have some more wine,' said Andrews. "'Go ahead, Andy, have all you want. "'I want something to warm my guts.' Antoinette brought a bottle of cognac and two small glasses and sat down in an empty chair with her red hands crossed on her apron. Her eyes moved from Crisfield to the Frenchman and back again. Crisfield turned a little round in his chair and looked at the Frenchman, feeling in his eyes for a moment a glance of the man's yellowish-brown eyes. Andrews leaned back against the wall, sipping his dark-colored wine, his eyes contracted dreamily, fixed on the shadows of the chandelier which the cheap oil lamp with its tin reflector cast on the peeling plaster of the wall opposite. Crisfield punched him. "'Wake up, Andy, are you asleep?' "'No,' said Andy, smiling. "'Have a little more cognac.' Crisfield poured out two more glasses unsteadily. His eyes were on Antoinette again. The faded purple frock was hooked at the neck. The first three hooks were undone revealing a V-shape of golden-brown skin and a bit of whitish underwear. "'Say, Andy,' he said, putting his arm round his friend's neck and talking into his ear, "'talk up to her for me, will yer, Andy? I won't let that goddamn frog get her, no, I won't, by God. Talk up to her for me, Andy.' Andrews laughed. "'I'll try,' he said. "'But there's always the Queen of Sheba, Chris.' "'Antoinette?' J'ai un ami, started Andrews, making a gesture with his long, dirty hand towards Chris. Antoinette showed her bad teeth in a smile. Joli garçon, said Andrews. Antoinette's face became impassive and beautiful again. Chrisfield leaned back in his chair with an empty glass in his hand and watched his friend admiringly. Antoinette, mon ami, vous... vous admire, said Andrews in a courtly voice. A woman put her head in the door. It was the same face and hair as Antoinette's, ten years older, only the skin, instead of being golden brown, was sallow and wrinkled. "'Viens!' said the woman in a shrill voice. Antoinette got up, brushed heavily against Crisfield's leg as she passed him, and disappeared. The Frenchman walked across the room from his corner, saluted gravely, and went out. Crisfield jumped to his feet. The room was like a white box reeling about him. "'That frog's gone after her!' he shouted. "'No, he ain't, Chris,' cried someone from the next table. "'Sit tight, old boy. We're betting on you.' "'Yes, sit down and have a drink, Chris,' said Andy. "'I've got to have something more to drink. I, I haven't had a thing to drink all the evening.' He pulled him back into his chair. Crisfield tried to get up again. Andrews hung on him so that the chair upset, then both sprawled on the red tiles of the floor. "'The house is pinched!' said a voice. Crisfield saw Judkins standing over him, a grin on his large red face. He got to his feet and sat sulkily in his chair again. Andrews was already sitting opposite him, looking impassive as ever. The tables were full now. Someone was singing in a droning voice. Oh, the oak and the ash and the weeping willow tree, 
Oh, green grows the grass in God's country. Oh, Indiana, shouted Chris, that's the only God's country I know. He suddenly felt that he could tell Andy all about his home and the wide cornfields shimmering and rustling under the July sun, and the creek with red clay banks where he used to go in swimming. He seemed to see it all before him, to smell the whiny smell of the silo, to see the cattle with their chewing mouths always stained a little with green, waiting to get through the gate to the water trough and the yellow dust and roar of wheat thrashing and the quiet evening breeze cooling his throat and neck when he lay out on a shack of hay that he had been tossing all day long under the tingling sun but all he managed to say was indiana's god's country ain't it andy oh he has so many muttered andrews i've seen a hailstone measured nine inches around at home honest to god I have. Must be as good as a barrage. I'd like to see any goddamn barrage do the damage one of our thunder and lightning storms will do, shouted Chris. I guess all the barrage we're going to see is grenade practice. Don't you worry, buddy, said somebody across the room. You'll see enough of it. This war's going to last damn long. I'd like to get in some licks at those Huns tonight. "'Honest to God, I would, Andy,' muttered Chris in a low voice. He felt his muscles contract with a furious irritation. He looked through half-closed eyes at the men in the room, seeing them in distorted white lights and reddish shadows. He thought of himself throwing a grenade among a crowd of men. Then he saw the face of Anderson, a ponderous white face with eyebrows that met across his nose, and a bluish, shaved chin. "'Where does he stay at, Andy? I'm going to get him.' Andrews guessed what he meant. "'Sit down and have a drink, Chris. Remember, you're going to sleep with the Queen of Sheba tonight. Not if I can't get them goddamn—' His voice trailed off into an inaudible muttering of oaths. "'Oh, the oak and the ash and the weeping willow tree—' Oh, green grows the grass in God's country, somebody sang again. Crisfield saw a woman standing beside the table, with her back to him, collecting the bottles. Andy was paying her. Antoinette, he said. He got to his feet and put his arms round her shoulders. With a quick movement of the elbows, she pushed him back into the chair. She turned round. He saw the sallow face and thin breasts of the older sister. She looked in his eyes with surprise. He was grinning drunkenly. As she left the room, she made a sign to him with her head to follow her. He got up and staggered out the door, pulling Andrews after him. In the inner room was a big bed with curtains where the women slept, and the fireplace where they did their cooking. It was dark except for the corner where he and Andrews stood, blinking in the glare of a candle on the table. Beyond they could only see ruddy shadows and the huge curtained bed with its red coverlet. The Frenchman, somewhere in the dark of the room, said something several times. Avion bouche! St! They were quiet. Above them they heard the snoring of aeroplane motors, rising and falling like the buzzing of a fly against a window pane. They all looked at each other curiously. Antoinette was leaning against the bed, her face expressionless. Her heavy hair had come undone and fell in smoky gold waves about her shoulders. The older woman was giggling. "'Come on, let's see what's doing, Chris,' said Andrews. They went out into the dark village street. "'To hell with women, Chris! This is the war!' cried Andrews in a loud, drunken voice as they reeled arm in arm up the street. "'You bet it's the war. I'm a-going to beat up.' Crisfield felt his friend's hand clapped over his mouth. He let himself go limply, feeling himself pushed to the side of the road. Somewhere in the dark he heard an officer's voice say, "'Bring those men to me.' "'Yes, sir,' came another voice. Slow, heavy footsteps came up the road in their direction. Andrews 
kept pushing him back along the side of a house, until suddenly they both fell sprawling in a manure pit. "'Lie still, for God's sake!' muttered Andrews, throwing an arm over Crisfield's chest. A thick odor of dry manure filled their nostrils. They heard the steps come nearer, wander about irresolutely, and then go off in the direction from which they had come. Meanwhile, the throb of motors overhead grew louder and louder. Well, came the officer's voice. Couldn't find them, sir, mumbled the other voice. Nonsense, those men were drunk, came the officer's voice. Yes, sir, came the other voice humbly. Crisfield started to giggle. He felt he must yell aloud with laughter. The nearest motor stopped its sing-song roar, making the night seem deathly silent. Andrews jumped to his feet. The air was split by a shriek, followed by a racking, snorting explosion. They saw the wall above their pit light up with a red momentary glare. Crisfield got to his feet, expecting to see flaming ruins. The village street was the same as ever. There was a little light from the glow the moon, still under the horizon, gave to the sky. A window in the house opposite showed yellow. In it was a blue silhouette of an officer's cap and uniform. A little group stood in the street below. "'What was that?' the form in the window was shouting in a peremptory voice. "'German aeroplane just dropped a bomb, Major,' came a breathless voice in reply. "'Why the devil don't he close that window?' a voice was muttering all the while. "'Just a target for him to aim at. A target to aim at. "'Any damage done?' asked the Major. Through the silence the snoring of the motors sing-songed ominously overhead, like giant mosquitoes. "'I seem to hear more.' said the major in his drawling voice. "'Oh, yes, sir, yes, sir, lots,' answered an eager voice. "'For God's sake, tell him to close the window, lieutenant,' muttered another voice. "'How the hell can I tell him? You tell him. "'We'll all be killed, that's all there is about it. "'There are no shelters or dugouts,' drawled the major from the window. "'That's headquarters' fault. "'There's the cellar,' cried the eager voice again. Oh, said the Major. Three snorting explosions in quick succession drowned everything in a red glare. The street was suddenly filled with a scuttle of villagers running to shelter. Say, Andy, they may have a roll call, said Crisfield. We'd better cut for home across country, said Andrews. They climbed cautiously out of their manure pit. Crisfield was surprised to find that he was trembling. His hands were cold. It was with difficulty he kept his teeth from chattering. God will stink for a week. Let's get out, muttered Crisfield, of this goddamn village. They ran out through an orchard, broke through a hedge, and climbed up the hill across the open fields. Down the main road, an anti-aircraft gun had started barking, and the sky sparkled with exploding shrapnel. The putt, putt, putt of a machine gun had begun somewhere. Crisfield strode up the hill in step with his friend. Behind them, bomb followed bomb, and above them the air seemed full of exploding shrapnel and droning planes. The cognac still throbbed a little in their blood. They stumbled against each other now and then as they walked. From the top of the hill they turned and looked back. Crisfield felt a tremendous elation thumping stronger than the cognac through his veins. Unconsciously he put his arm round his friend's shoulders. They seemed the only live things in a reeling world. Below in the valley a house was burning brightly. From all directions came the yelp of anti-aircraft guns, and overhead unperturbed, continued the leisurely sing-song of the motors. Suddenly Crisfield burst out laughing. "'By God, I always have fun when I'm out with you, Andy,' he said. They turned and hurried down the other slope of the hill towards the farms where they were quartered. End 
of section six